Thank you for joining us for this episode. Today, we're joined by Dr. Moishi uh, Mendelssohn, and he is out of Silicon Valley. He's going to be sharing with us about how we bring myopia to the forefront of our practice. Optometric Insights Media proudly presents the Myopia Podcast, where we give you the latest myopia research, clinical topics, and industry insights. Make sure to subscribe to stay up to date on all of our awesome myopia content. And now to our host, a massive myopia manager himself, Dr. David Kading. Well, thank you again for joining us for this episode today. As I mentioned, we are joined by Moshe Mendelssohn, Dr. Moshe Mendelssohn. And uh, Dr. Mendelssohn has uh, been doing myopia management uh, from before it was even called myopia, it seems like. I'm just kidding. I'm not dating you that long. But, uh, you know, was really one of the forefathers of myopia management. And today I kind of want to talk with him about a couple of different uh, different topics. But first of all, uh, for those of you people who don't know you, I mean, most people in the myopia space know you. Tell us a little bit about you and your practice and what you're up to these days. Thank you, uh, David. It's a pleasure to, to talk to you and hopefully move the agenda in the myopia management and have more of our colleagues uh, participate in this effort, which I think yeah. is wonderful. Um, I'm in private practice, uh, Silicon Valley Physicians in the Bay Area, um, uh, San Francisco Bay Area, um, started my open management in 1990, shortly after graduating from UC Berkeley. And we actually have a dedicated myopia wing in our office, specifically for myopia care. We have other uh, four ODs that uh, help along to uh, provide care for young patients and change lives, basically. Awesome. I love that and change lives, right? I mean, we, we tend to not think about, um, we historically have not thought about changing patients' lives when they're pediatrics with their intensive myopia, but really what we're doing is when these people turn 40, 50, 60, 70 years old, and we've changed their lives when they're 10, 15 years old with what we're doing, you know, at the, at the early stages. So I love that we are changing lives, and that's yes. something that I think is one of the delays in people getting excited about myopia management. You said that you have a dedicated myopia wing of yes. your practice. What the heck? That's weird. Tell us more about that. You know, um, about four or five years ago, I took part of the building and renovated it. It's about 2,500 square feet specifically for myopia. So patients that come into the office understand that myopia is a real thing. It's almost like in the dental you know, area, People go to the dentist, but then they go to the orthodontists. So we basically imply that we specialize in myopia care within our office. And we've dedicated uh, space and technology and staff specifically for this um, you know, area. Uh, it basically elevates the patient's experience with respect to myopia management. And understand it's not just fitting the patient with a simple contact lens and it's a done deal. So it's, it's an experience it's a process, it's a journey that we take together. And it's a lot different than fitting a patient with the, the daily disposable contact lenses, let's say, or just regular right, contact lenses. Right, right. Well, so having been doing this for 30 years, myopia management, like you have since you graduated in 1990, um, or started in 1990, um, as Craig Norman said on my podcast, myopia management is a 30 year overnight success right? It's all of a sudden becoming something that people are wanting to get into yes. for the last 30 years. In my case, the last 15 years, I've been lecturing all around the world on the importance of myopia management. You know, Brian Holden has really led the charge on, on getting the word out there and it's, it's becoming a movement. And it's, um, I don't know if you've read the book, The Tipping Point, but we're at the tipping point. For, for people who, who don't don't really know what to do and how to get into this. What are some things nowadays that are easier getting into myopia management than they were 30 years ago when, when you started doing this? Tell, tell us a little bit about how you see this as easier now than it was back then. Excellent, excellent point, David. So when I started, when you started, um, it was a very steep gradient curve to learn how to design the night lenses. It took a lot of expertise, took a lot of expertise and show time. Uh, today, with the my site that is FDA approved for myopia management, with the ability that is approved in Canada, and uh, some additional products that are coming to the marketplace, I think it's a lot easier. I, I think that if you know how to fit a one-day disposable lens, 
you know how to fit uh, the my site or, or similar products. Um, I also think that um, it's easier because we have better tools and more tools in our possession. For example, many years ago, we could only use the night lenses. Now we have patients on monotherapy or dual therapy. So we have a lot of patients that are on a combined therapy of you know, the night lenses, the day lenses plus atopy. So we can afford more uh, to our patients. We have a much better handle on preventing uh, bad cases and vision impairment later in life for many of our patients. And I'm rem reminded of that every day when I have a patient who is minus 10 or minus 12, who is myopic degeneration, and I say, I wish I saw this patient 20 years ago because they wouldn't be in this situation. Yeah. Yeah. So what are some tools you think that uh, we have available to us that, that we, we didn't really have before? And what would you suggest people do to get, to get started? I think that uh, there's a lot of support from various companies such as right. Super and Johnson & Johnson and Essilo, basically um, educating the parents about why, what, and how, if you will, right? So they basically educate the parents about the consequences of not treating myopia and then mm -hmm. about the tools that are available. So I think these, um, these big companies uh, are very helpful in creating very informative websites that are at yeah. our fingertips that we can use uh, and reference and educate patients. So um, in the past, again, 30 years ago, when I would tell patients, listen, we can do, I can do it for you, for your child, they looked at me and said, are you serious? I, I don't believe that's possible. But now with a big company like Johnson & Johnson or Cooper uh, standing behind it, more people have more confidence that this is real and um, they're going to basically give it more consideration. Yeah, yeah. Now, one of the things that you've, you, you've done with, within your practice in the Bay Area is you have a website that is, is second to none as far as a practice website that really kind of focuses on this. And is this one of the, how, how do you get patients? Is your website a big part of that? Um, David, the, the secret sauce is one patient at a time. I have a, a, I have a lot of ambassadors that. in the community. My previous patients spread the word, right? So obviously you have to have good online, uh, you know, online uh, presence, but the best promotion is your happy patients. And they go out and they, um, tell other parents about it. I had a patient the other day and I, I asked her curiously, you know, how did you find out about us? She says, I went to next door and I saw a name from six different neighbors saying you need to go to Silicon Valley Eye Physician. So, so your happiest patients they are going to be your ambassadors. And the more myopia management you do, the more you'll do. In other words, it's like a snowball because your patients are going to be your ambassadors in the community and they'll refer patients to you. So I have a little bit of a a little bit of a qualm to say with that, right? So I've been doing myopia management, and just like you, it's the number one way that we get patients to come in the door. Is there? It, it, and, and I talk about this word of mouth marketing as being active or passive, right? So I treat my patients well; they're going to send people in. That's true, right? But is there something you can say to the patient that encourages them to say something else? And do you do that from the chair? For example, sometimes when I see somebody who is just elated, right? They're excited about their myopia management. The kid loves not having to wear glasses or they you know, get to wear soft contact or whatever it is. Or the parent is super excited that now we've slowed down the progression. I say to them, hey, if you know anybody with eyeballs, we'd love to meet them, right? And the, the little kid stops for a second and then chuckles, right? But that's an active word of mouth request for a referral. Do you do something similar or do you do something to encourage that referral? I should do more, honestly. I'm a little shy when it comes <laughs> we to all that. Should. I don't want to talk my, talk my horn. So uh, I think that's excellent advice. Um, my office manager, is on me all the time to basically do that. Uh, and I think that I can do more of that. That's honestly uh, what I right. said. Well, well, <laughs> well, obviously the passive word of mouth has worked effectively with you. Mm -hmm. do, you have, uh, do, do you have an idea of how busy of a, 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 of a week this is with myopia management, right? Some people say, hey, I, you know, I, I don't have time in my schedule to see more of these patients. Now I recall when I was first doing orthokeratology years ago, I would I would have to spend 
tons of time diagnostically fitting or tons of time computer generating a lens that I would, you know, fix all the curves and everything. But for, for me, it's, it's a lot faster than it used to be, Absolutely. right? What are some ways that we can encourage people and say, hey, it's not going to take as long as you think? I think that, again, um, you have to make the time if you want to be successful. Um, and it doesn't take too much time, again, with the new uh, software designs for the night lenses or the new versions of the day lenses. And um, I think from a business perspective, if you want to uh, prosper with all the other things that are going around us, you must dedicate your time to provide myopia management among other profit centers, if you will. Uh, yeah. But I think you need to, to make the time, I would say, allow um, half a day a week maybe, start with that. And um, slowly, slowly, you'll see that things are going a lot quicker and a lot more efficient. Uh, what I do, which may be more difficult in other practices, I delegate a lot to my staff. Right. So yeah. I delegate a lot to my staff. I have two NCLEs that uh, work alongside with me. And they uh, basically spend a lot of time with the patients before I even see the patient preparing the patient, educating the patient, sending information before they come to the office for the consultation. Um, so again, that's the way I do it. I, I delegate yeah. a lot. Now, I, I, I want to hit on something, and, and that is what happens before a patient comes in for, for a visit? New patient, never seen by you. Hopefully they've heard something about myopia management, which is the reason they're coming in to see you. What is the important information for them to receive ahead of time? There's too so, much information sometimes. Yes. Right? So if, if we know that the patient specifically uh, appointed themselves for myopia management consultation, we are going to send them an email that will basically let them know what to expect during the visit. Mm -hmm. and, and then we are going to hit upon some of the important points that I think are important that we have to keep reintroducing to the patients. So when they come in, they already heard about the hyperopic defocus, they already heard about the consequences of not treating myopia, they already heard about the, the basically benefits of getting rid of glasses or daytime contact lenses. So we send them this information. Sometimes they read it, sometimes they don't. Uh, we also couple it with videos showing uh, uh, you know, what the practice looks like, what the staff looks like. So when they arrive, they already know us, so to speak. So, um, so if, when a patient calls in, we schedule an appointment a few days ahead of time, they'll get an email. It will basically talk about the things we just discussed. We have also a few, a few videos that we touch to it because patients sometimes don't like to read, but they take a look at the video and take a look at the photo. You know, it was funny. I just today got Google Analytics and uh, we uploaded the photo of our you know, doctors on the website. And I couldn't believe we had more than 30,000 views you know, in one month. So it's crazy. I couldn't believe it. But people so don't... Tell me, tell me more. You have 30,000 views of what? Of patients' views on photos that we put on the website. So the message here, David, is people that don't like to read. People are more visual. So if you send a video, if you send a photo, you're going to get their attention. I don't think they're going to sit there and read too, for too long. No, no. And if people want to check out your website, it's myopi.com. M-Y-O-P-I pair, C-A-R-E, Myopi care, right? Not myopia care, M-Y-O-P-I-C-A-R-E dot com. And I would encourage people to check your website out, but you're right, you know, these these images and, you know, the, 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 the case studies that you have on here, the testimonials, this is a uh, a great example of what a, uh, a practice needs to look like. You've got videos that are on here and so forth. And so I'd encourage people to, to go check that out. You've, you've obviously had some professional video done yes. for your website. Mm -hmm. uh, what was the stimulus for that? Um, we felt that we need to uh, basically get someone who knows what they're doing. And, but now we also do a lot of... Uh, I know what I'm doing. I got an yeah. iPhone right here. Exactly. Right? <laughs> I, I to go to the, so now the last few videos that actually you'll see, uh, and I'll send you the email that I sent patients after this call so you can see what yeah. they're doing. They have been uh, filmed on iPhone. Sure. 
But there's one more important point that I want to get across with respect to encouraging our colleagues to approach patients and do myopia management or myopia control. So a lot of my kids, my colleagues will say, you know, I saw a child, he's only minus 50, I'm not going to worry about it. The child is six years of age. And I say to my colleagues, yes, he's six years of age now, minus 50, but now I think about this child as a minus seven when they're 17. And I'm going to treat them not as a minus 50, but as a minus seven. And I know that our colleagues are very conscientious and they're going to uh, basically say, this is a minus seven if I do nothing, it's going to be on me if I don't intervene. And I think that's another way to try and convince, for lack of a better word, some of my co uh, our colleagues to pursue PMA management and not just wave it off. It's, it's just a minus 50, no big deal. It's not a minus 50, it's a minus seven if you do nothing about it. Yeah, no, that's so true. I mean, those of us who are doing myopia management, we pull up you know, the growth charts and we see that, uh, that kiddo who is, uh, you know, I had, a, I had a seven year old who was a minus three the other day, right? Um, you know, we pull up that growth chart and that kid is going to be a very, very, very high myope, uh, especially if we don't do anything about it. But even that minus 50, right? What has the historic approach been for a minus 50 patients? We'll see what happens. Right. We know what happens. Yep. That's, that's what we had said for years is, and that has to go away because we know right. what will happen, right? Yes. We know what is going to happen when mm -hmm. a child is uh, in the 95th percentile for height at six years old and his dad and mom are six five, right? We, we kind of know, right? Yeah. We yeah. know what is gonna happen in myopia for those minus 50 kids who are minus six or seven. They have a six to seven times greater risk of developing high myopia. And uh, we, we just have to be thinking that. And you know, I like what you said at the beginning is we have to be moving myopia management to the forefront of our practices and be realizing that this is not just something that we can sit on the, uh, on the sidelines anymore. Yeah. Any, uh, any last tips or suggestions for people who are, uh, who are dabbling or kind of playing around with this as to how they can go all in? Yeah, I think that, um, again, from past experience, uh, don't take upon yourself a very complicated case. Start with the simple cases um, that are going to most likely not take too much of your chill time and give you good success. And this will basically be the, the wind in your sails, and that will encourage you to keep going. In addition to that, uh, the parents of these kids are going to refer patients to you because of the success. Um, so I think that's, that's uh, don't say, I'll, I'll think about it, I'll do it, just get off your high knee or rear end and just do it, yeah. you know? And that's what they need to do. You know, I, I, I agree with you in some senses, but I think the barriers to entry are far lower than they used to be. I would agree 100% with you if we're doing orthokeratology, which I, like you, I think is our primary method of myopia management. It counts for about 70 to 80% of my myopia management. But if somebody's kind of dabbling and they're thinking about getting in, I would say for your ortho K patients, don't try a minus five as your first. But if you have a kid who's a minus four and is eight years old, nine years old, get them into a soft daily disposable lens like a MySight or an Atreview or something you know, consider doing atropine. We've got tools that we can use um, for any age. And, uh, you know, if, if, if you buy an OCT thinking you're going to get into glaucoma, you do that on almost every patient that, you know, it's, it's kind of get off, off the ground and get running. Right. And I would really consider what getting into myopia management needs to be a, let's go for it. Let's do it. If a kid is a myope, we're treating them right? And get, get right into it. And very quickly, we find uh, great resources and great tools to make us successful. Uh, couldn't agree with you more. Fantastic. All right. Well, hey, thank you for being on the Myopia podcast. It's always a, a pleasure to get to hear from uh, people who have been leading the field and, uh, and guiding and setting the direction that we're going and, uh, you know, reach out to you and thank you for all the work that you've done over the years. Your practice is an inspiration to me and I know to many other people. So thank you for what you do. It was a pleasure and uh, thank you for inviting me. Yeah, absolutely. And thank you for joining us for this episode of the Myopia Podcast. Make sure to subscribe, like, share it with all your friends and uh, we'll, uh, we'll hear, see you next time on the next episode of the Myopia Podcast. Bye-bye.
This podcast was brought to you by Optometric Insights Media. If you enjoy our content, please leave a five-star review and don't forget to subscribe for more great episodes.